All right, uh, my name's Tom Wilhelm. I'm gonna be doing, uh, I've spoken before, but this is gonna be a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more casual. Uh, this is gonna be a high level discussion. The technical components uh, to this, I'm gonna do in the Q&A outside. It's not gonna just be q and A. I'm actually gonna talk about the van, some of the, uh, the physical architecture behind it, some of the problems that I've had, some of the advantages I've had. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in seeing how I actually implement it, beyond what I talk about here, I, I'd encourage you to come out and check it out. I'm gonna do uh, the concepts behind the hackerspace, some advantages and some disadvantages of how a mobile hackerspace works, and then I'll give you my real, real world example up here. And uh, just a little bit about me, uh, a lot of guys have probably actually already read some of my stuff, you just don't know it. Uh, I've got some certifications, I actually am employed, I do some teaching, and I'm a, a PhD student as well, so a lot of my cash disappears. So one of the reasons why uh, that's gonna be coming important is about cost, so. All right, so the concept behind hackerspaces, this is a definition that I grab, grabbed off of Hacker Foundation. It's basically saying that anytime anybody gets together, that a group of hackers get together, then you've got a hackerspace. And, and it breaks it out into four types uh, we've got local gatherings, conventions, uh, hacker group, live living situations, and a fixed hacker research spaces. That's the last one is what most people fixate on, the fixed hacker research spaces. Uh, now, of course, for the last couple of years, we've been talking about hacker space, and it, it's, it's really cool. So um, part of my mind when, over the last couple of years is that uh, I really would like to have a hacker space. Uh, I'm from Colorado Springs. And the community there is a lot smaller than a lot of the ones that you hear about, like over in Germany and New York and stuff like that. But, you know, it's nice and shiny, and I still wanted one anyway. Uh, here's some hacker spaces that are out there. Uh, Chaos Computer Club says they have over 2,000 members. Uh, CBase said that they had around 300 members. And New York City Resistors, their current status is 24. They've locked down new members. They, there's no new members. Um, but uh, when it came down to it, really, this is... These were, numbers were still a lot larger than what I wanted to do, and uh, that I figured that my, my uh, hometown would actually support. So I needed to figure out how to downscale this a little bit. And one of the big things that worried me from the get-go, and I hear this a lot, I've gone to quite a few talks, I went out to, to New York, uh, to the Hope, and there was a bunch of panels on that as well. And basically what it came down to is cost. Everything was basic around cost. Uh, for example, Seabase almost went bankrupt back in July. Uh, they needed, they received in a big mass campaign around 20,000 euros uh, of 30,000 that they needed. So even at that time, they were still in the hole. Uh, New York City Resistors, uh, when they, off of their website, you can grab some information about what they were looking for. I think their actual current price is around 16 or $1,700 a month for their space, and I think it's around 1,000 square foot. I looked around locally for rent, and I found a place that was like 1,200 square feet, and it was about $800 a month. That was probably one of the better deals that I could find. Still, my thought process is this was still too expensive. So I needed to find an alternate solution. <clears throat> Another op option was a garage. I had a garage, I live in an apartment, and uh, some of the advantages of that was, first it was free, but. Then uh, there was issues about power and then convenient, and really the worst part is that it's cold in winter. Uh, availability of users, if I give out my number, you know, anybody and everybody in the world can get to it. And then, of course, as you guessed it, just like everybody else, my garage is an absolute dump. So there's no way I was gonna clean that out. I had to think of something else, really what it came down to. Kind of breezing through this, so. Some other ideas that are out there. There's, you can, some people have actually talked about setting up room in a house. If you've got a small enough community and you've got like a back door or you've got something like that, you can set up a room in your house. But that's, for me and my family, I've got a couple little girls. That was just way too stressful. Not gonna do that. What the current group uh, gatherings consist of is people will meet, and this is like DEF CON groups, and it, most people can relate to this. Most meetings occur at a, a restaurant or coffee house, typically. It's a coffee house. Uh, they get together primarily because that's where the internet is, and they give presentations and stuff like that. But there's no permanency with it. The, the one in Colorado Springs has had to uh, just recently hop, but 
Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the real reason. And it wasn't a hackerspace, it was just the DC group. Also, there's local colleges. Some col uh, students would like to set up um, meetings and stuff at their college. Well, uh, Denver had a problem with their DC group where they were originally holding it in a college, but you had to have a somebody actually teaching there, and you had to have they, they had to have time and willing to schedule rooms and things like that for that. So basically, what happened is scheduling became an issue, sponsorship became an issue. Uh, they ended up having to find a different place to locate. What did I want? I just stepped back and said, okay, what do I really want? I needed something that was cheap. I'm a student, don't really want to pay too much. Uh, some of the things that they were talking about is isolation from neighbors. I really wanted something that was modular. Uh, I really didn't know exactly what the community was going to want, and I didn't know exactly uh, what kind of um, structures I needed for, to meet those projects. Uh, so it had to be modular, whatever I came up with. I also wanted a place for classes since I teach I get into that mode where I want to spread knowledge and I figured a hackerspace would be a good way to do that. And if you look around, all the hackerspaces try to do that at least once a week. They do classes, usually to generate income, but I'm, I'm not really concerned about that. And then the last one is, it would be cool. Uh, first of all, hackerspaces are cool. It would be cool if it, I if actually had something that was of interest uh, to other people, but that was optional, of course. I had uh, some history with uh, mobile vehicles. Uh, my father actually had converted a uh, large Greyhound bus back in the 70s into a motorhome. He did a really fantastic job. Uh, so I had some understanding, and it, this is how I was able to expand that box that most people get stuck in when they're trying to come up with a solution on how to solve this, is that I understood that I could set up situ uh, a hackerspace, basically, in a um, motorhome or something along those lines. Uh, you can find out online that there are some used buses, and, and they vary in, in prices, uh, linked down at the bottom. But what I got was through Craigslist, I found a Class B motorhome. It's a vine, uh, van size camper, and because of it, it's considered a Class B, I didn't have to get any special uh, driving permits or license or anything like that. Uh, now, this is really freaking ugly, I, I, I will admit. Uh, my wife affectionately called it um, uh, hunk of junk, so I, I thought it was appropriate at that time. So let me get some questions out of the way. These are usually the facts, uh, frequently asked questions I get. First of all, yes, I know the 70s won it back. Second of all, there is no shag, shag carpet in it, well, at least not anymore. No, I don't live down by the river, and no, there's no free candy in there. So uh, just so you guys know, uh, it doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, I paid a starving artist uh, 350 bucks. I mean, it was, it was worth it to have him come by and paint it. And when you guys go outside, you'll actually see the, the full glory of it. But here's a quick shot of it. It's a little bit different. Now, at this point, I wanted to point out that this van is not meant to be something covert. As you can tell, it would be hard to be covert. But basically, what I wanted to do is provide a platform for a community to get together. And I'll talk about how this helps that community not only get together, but to stay together and grow. So advantages, it's mobile, big surprise. You can park it anywhere. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been talking about is uh, you can take it to the park, you can take it to the coffee shop, you can do barbecues, you can take it to a friend's house, you can go paintballing, you know, go out to paintballing during breaks, you know, you want to put together uh, a team and go play at lunch breaks, you can sit there and check your email and stuff like that. Uh, you can go anywhere where the hacking opportunities are. There's war driving opportunities, conventions, like this one as well. I mean, it is parked outside from Colorado Springs. There's also the mobile classroom. The, la the thing gets to go wherever you go. Now, when I talked about how it built a, the com built a community, if you think about the, the advantage of having a mobile hackerspace over a fixed one, the only time everybody gets together is either to do projects or they have to do their Tuesday meeting at 7 o'clock, which is, I guess, required. And then uh, they also have uh, a, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll do, like, sometimes they'll do movie nights or something like that. Well, you're stuck. You're stuck in that facility, and everybody has to get to, to that one place. Well. In Colorado, we have a lot of opportunities to do things outside. 
And I wanted to take advantage of that, go, go to the park, go fishing and things like that. Not only does it build the community of hackers because you guys are hacking, but it also builds a community where you find external interests like fishing or paintballing and stuff like that. So it provides an opportunity to bond that a fixed location may not necessarily have. So keep that in mind when you start thinking about the advantages of a mobile hacker space. Some other advantages, cost is minimized. I bought it, I pay a very low amount for insurance, and then there's gas. Uh, except for this, and I'll talk about the actual price, it cost me about five, it's gonna cost me about $500 round trip to drive out here for gas for the thing. But uh, from January until now, I've used half a tank. So, I mean, it's really inexpensive. Yeah, seriously. Uh, you can support a large range of people. I mean, you, you think about the van and you try to imagine packing everybody in there. That works somewhat. I mean, I can stick about eight people in there, really, and, and that's really too close. But uh, two to four people is, is usually pretty good. You can get some stuff going. But because it's mobile, it usually has something else outside the doors. And uh, like uh, we park it at a gazebo and throw out some chairs and tables and stuff like that. So people can be outside and do things outside as well, uh, talk, smoke, whatever. And in fact, uh, you know, as long as the hardware itself can sustain it, you can add as many people on as you want. We've got two networks going, um, broadband access to the internet, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So it does have the opportunity to provide a large number of people access to things that they want to do even though they're not crammed into a van. It doesn't have to be a clown car. Some more advantages. Uh, modular. Everything that's in that van can be taken out. I've got everything set up in a way that uh, the panels and everything inside are quick disconnect. You can gut it out and throw something else in there, redesign it however you need to do it. The uh, storage space, if you want a bunch, you know, if you want to do some hacking uh, at uh, when you're doing paintballing or something like that, you can throw all your gear in the back of the van. It is a cargo van. So it has an opportunity to lug stuff out to wherever you need to. I can also throw things in there like, uh, you know, those, those temporary um, um, covers and, and uh, lawn chairs or what need, whatever need there is. And then once you pull all that out, you've got the accessibility in the van again. So you can add stuff in, you can haul stuff as needed based on whatever you're, you're planning on doing. Obviously, advanced long distance travel, travel them here. Some disadvantages. Some disadvantages is that it's mobile. Uh, gas is, uh, can, is ridiculous, like I said, $500 round trip. Insurance costs, you gotta pay that. Uh, it's not nearly as bad as if you had a fixed site where you gotta pay utilities and you gotta pay for uh, insurance and you know, liabilities and all that other stuff. As, uh, it's a lot less. There's wear and tear, it's a vehicle. Uh, you, know, you might need to change it out the carpet or you just rip out the carpet in in a, a, a fixed site, but in this case, there are things that are gonna get beaten up and you really need to be concerned with it. There's theft. Theft is, is always a problem, not necessarily where I'm located, but you, that's something that you always gotta keep in mind. We have a standing rule that if you put it in there and you leave it in there, you should be willing to see it disappear that next day. Uh, so don't leave anything in there that, that you might not want to have disappear. Uh, we encourage everybody to uh, pack up their project stuff and, and throw it in the back of their car because we have limited space. Everything has to be very managed as far as what we put in there. Uh, we can't expand it. Uh, we could always buy a trailer and things like that, but then we're ha ha hauling around a trailer full of junk, and I, I really don't want to do that either. All right, there's some other disadvantages. Electricity. Uh, if, you can, if you can drive the vehicle to a place where you hook up, and there are those places, but they're not really that frequent, uh, you end up having to run completely off of batteries. Uh, square footage is limited, as I mentioned before. That means there's a limited number of uh, batteries that you could put in there. Uh, right now, there is no compartment underneath the vehicle, and that's something I'd like to do eventually, but uh, there's no compartment for batteries. And even if there was, there's gonna be limited square footage. There's always been a problem with that. Uh, one of the cool parts is that because this concept is based around a motorhome, there, a lot of these things have already been discussed and, and hammered out in that community for the last 30 years. Uh, everybody understands that uh, you, there's a big knowledge basis on what an inverter is and how many type, what kind of batteries you should get and what kind of uh, you know, deep cell versus regular batteries, lead, uh, 
lead based. Uh, there's a bunch of things, that, a lot of discussions. You can get really into it, and as you know, a uh, bunch of hackers, I'm sure that uh, that would be uh, uh, pretty interesting for a lot of people here. So, uh, let's see, square footage limited, expansive, everything seems to want to grow too. Uh, there's always like, well, let's add this to it. You got to be very careful about how you do that for the batteries and plug into the grid limits your mobility. Once you plug in, you know, you're stuck. It's not like you can go to the lake and plug in necessarily. There are sometimes spots, very rarely. So you got to be, you got to plan ahead as far as your electricity demand and things like that. Subject, uh, you're subjected to the elements. Uh, as you guys, when we go to the Q&A after this, you will notice that there's, uh, that van is basically one of those uh, hot boxes. It feels like a Vietnam War kind of thing where you get in there and uh, five minutes later you're out. Uh, the heat of the equipment is also there too. Uh, obviously, some of the problems that uh, is true with any of the hacker spaces and, and the uh, people over in Europe have talked about this as well, is that you get crammed into one of these things, you, you're really gonna notice there's no, no room for uh, uncirculated air. Uh, Colorado is freaking cold. Las Vegas is freaking hot, and you can't really escape that. Uh, unfortunately, since this van is older, the AC unit is meant for usually one or two people, and right now it's not even charged, so I'm driving through Utah in hot, hot weather. And it's also no fun hacking in the rain. I, I put rain, but you know that might be here. Colorado, snow. So let's talk a little bit about some of the work that's been done uh, previous concerning hacker spaces, and then we're going to compare the mobile hacker space to those designs. Chaos Computer Club did a talk, I think it was last year, where they designed, they did design patterns, and they've, they've refined it a little bit. And they put together a list of things that need to be focused on and when you put together a hacker space. Uh, I've adopted or I've taken some of those to show you how this mobile hacker space fits in that overall understanding of what a hacker space should be. And uh, we're going to do a comparison. We're going to see their problems, their solutions, and then uh, we're going to talk about how this van sits in, in that. Uh, I only picked some of those that are really relevant. There are some that are, are not relevant really at all. And if you go back and you look at their presentation, you'll understand why. But these are the lists. The six here are the ones that I really wanted to focus on uh, for this presentation. So there's an infrastructure problem. Uh, what do you do first, infrastructure or projects? Well, in this case, uh, I knew that there was going to be certain projects that were going to naturally fit into the vehicle. Uh, but it still had to be infrastructure driven as, um, as well. So we did, you know, the, their suggestion is to make everything infrastructure driven and then you basically uh, based on the limitations or availability, people will come up with projects based around that. Now, the one the people at New York City Resistors, uh, their talk at Hope, they indicated that they were having some problems with electricity, primarily because they wanted to put a laser in there. But um, so that is something that is a problem. Infrastructure is, is very critical. Our solution: uh, there is some room in the van. Uh, there's additional space outside. Uh, we have a generator and the batteries. Um, power is, is a constant problem, and you're very limited on what you can run in this, uh, this van. Uh, servers, we decided to go with some virtualization. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. If you're going to be running servers, you might as well try to keep your, your electricity footprint as small as possible by doing virtualization. Connectivity. Right now, there's actually two networks that are up and running. We have an internet one, and we have a lab one. Uh, it, later on, you'll see slides. There's, it has the full capability of doing four different uh, networks, and, and I'll talk about that when we get to that slide. Uh, additional facilities. Unfortunately, we don't have a restroom in the van. Well, thank goodness we don't have a restroom in the van. But uh, so what we'll do typically is uh, right now, since it's parked at the apartment complex, there are facilities that the apartment has uh, by the pool area. So, I mean, the, the immediate ones are taken care of. If we ever ro uh, relocate to uh, like a you know, paintball or um, going fishing or something like that, there usually are facilities for that as well, not showers, but uh, uh, you get the gist. So, landlord and neighborhood pattern. 
because the, it says that you found a perfect actor space, but the landlord seems to be a little weird and the neighbors are picky. Well, I haven't gotten any complaints about the paint job of the van, um, so, so far so good. Uh, uh, but their implementation suggestion is that when you choose wisely, you, you got to know your community, you got to know the people that are around you, and you got to know your landlord, and, and you got to have a really close working relationship with all those. So our solution is that the van is located at the car, uh, apartment complex. Uh, we can, um, it's actually the area that we park it in is distant from most area, other areas. It, there's a little uh, area where there's a gazebo and, and park area kind of stuff. Uh, and you can actually do the same kind of thing anywhere you needed to do it. If you were in a more congested area, you might even think about putting it on the street at that point. Uh, it can quickly be moved if there is a problem. If neighbors com start complaining, I'm going to just move it down to another block. It's no big deal. So this, the problem of separation of individuals. Um, the problem is that you want to chill, discuss, and work in the small groups. And there's also problems with uh, smoking. And there's also problems with uh, competition for space. Uh, and their implementation is that you need to find a place that has actually smaller rooms. Well. In some of those cases, uh, I mean, when you're working with a thousand square feet, it's kind of hard to separate areas for that. So uh, I understand that it's a very complicated thing to deal with uh, in a fixed site. So our solution, since it's a van, people are actually mentally encouraged to get outside the van. I mean, they're, they're, there's some cool stuff on the inside, but then uh, for the people who smoke, there's the natural tendency to step outside and have a smoke. So we end up having two real, uh, we have the, the bigger congestion is actually outside the van. And people can break out very easily uh, based on, on their needs for that. Uh, unfortunately, weather can provide a, a bit of a complication to that. Uh, the gazebo provides some uh, protection. Uh, if you move it to a restaurant, obviously it provides a lot more protection. Uh, so it depends on your environment that you're actually in. Kitchen pattern. Their suggestion is that people need food, people need drinks. Uh, that's cool. Uh, I totally agree with that, especially the caffeine component. Uh, their suggestion is that you use the, you know, you provide an opportunity like microwaves, even a, a full kitchen. Uh, you start teaching people how to cook. You you give them an opportunity to buy drinks from you. Helps with profit or at least pay for rent and things like that. And uh, talks about uh, freezers, uh, showers, things that really are complicated for a van. So how do we deal with that? Basically, if we connect to an external source, uh, basically run a, cap uh, a power cable, a power extension cord to the van, we could throw additional things in there. That's not a problem. But a whole idea behind the being mobile is that it, it needs to be mobile. And tethering it into a, a power supply is not necessarily the smartest thing to do. Um, so when really the rest of this is we're talking about running off of batteries. Because of that po uh, power pole that microwaves have or um, uh, hot pots and things like that, those are, those are forbidden. Um, plus, you know, if, if you start messing up and, you know, you make the van inaccessible for people as well. We do provide snacks, uh, you know, chips and things like that, stuff for, straight out of Sam's. Uh, drinks are available requires a cooler, and that's actually something else that's kind of a, a, a pain is that ice supply. I mean, if you've got a refrigerator at home, no big deal. Uh, unfortunately for us, uh, ice melts, and there's no real way to generate new ice. So that's always going to be something that we have to deal with. Coziness pattern. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. I totally agree. Hopefully, um, You'll understand that in cases, there are suggestions, things like couches, sofa, comfortable chairs. That seems to be a little bit more out of our, our capability of, of doing things like that. Ambient light, stereo equipment, projector, video game consoles, all, all heavy power poles. You've got to be very careful in those last groups. So our solution is that um, we provide alternative activities. Uh, if, you know, not only the idea behind the, the fixed ones is that they, you give them an opportunity to do something else in that space. Well, what if you don't care about 
that space? What about if you just want to do something else? Let's just move the van to that something else and do it. Uh, like I said here, we've got paintballing, fishing, picnics, things like that. Uh, it, it varies. Your, your own mind can expand. And basically, what the, whatever the group wants to do at the time, uh, it's very informal. If you uh, want to do something on the weekend, go to the movies or something like that, you can, you can be flexible enough to do that. Uh, because of the theft of risk, high-end consoles are, are actually not left in the space. I provide um, uh, 360, uh, and we do have a, a, a projector and uh, things like that. So we still have that functionality there. We still have that opportunity to do other things. It's just that they're not left in there. So if somebody actually does want to show up and, and wants to watch movies or something like that, they can do that. They just need to coordinate or bring their own. Something else I wanted to say. Oh, as far as stereo equipment and stuff, we actually do have, like, you know, the, the cheapy computer stereos and things like that that provide, those don't have nearly a, the pole as most stereo equipments would have. And uh, there are ambient lights. We had to go LED lights, those, uh, those cable lights. Those are actually really, the rope lights, they're pretty cool. Uh, they don't really pull a whole lot of juice. So that's one of the reasons why we, we went with those. So membership fees. Problem is you need to pay rent, you need to pay utilities, you need to pay insurance, you need to do all those things that, that are, uh, are necessary. And this is really where everybody gets stuck before they launch a, a uh, hacker space, it seems, is that they're really worried about how they're gonna fund it. I mean, when you're talking around $2,000 a month for a, uh, a hacker space, it's, it's atrocious. Uh, you gotta get some serious commitments. Remember the New York City resistor people saying that they got nine people to cough up $1,000 each that they said they would never see again. And they had to increase their membership cost to $75 so that they can increase their cash pool. Uh, it, it makes sense uh, to do that, but that is, th those people are on the hook, those 24 members are on the hook for $75 a month. And if one drops out, then you gotta find somebody else. And they talk about electing a totalitarian treasurer. Um, I, in previous experience, I've, I've had to deal from that perspective and I absolutely hated it. I hated getting the phone calls. I didn't want anything to do with that. So our solution is buy a van straight out. There's no rent, just insurance, fuel, and repairs. So fuel, contributions to pay for gas are encouraged. Um, there are, uh, we, we take either cash donations, we take uh, you know, sales from the, the chips, people, you know, we, we tell them whatever you wanna pay for the chips and sodas. Um, and people will throw in five bucks, things like that. Uh, so it's just, uh, um, it's basically there's no real big push as far as how we get that money for fuel. Repairs, right now the, the repairs are, are done by me. Uh, and, the, and the way I look at it, it's still a lot cheaper than paying $800 a month, um, you know, putting my butt on the line and making sure that it happens. I'm not gonna do that but I'm willing to replace the tires or get the transmission fixed or something like that. And if there's actually a major repair that needs to be done, I don't really foresee any problem of getting donations together. And, and until it actually gets fixed, it just stays parked. It's still functional as a hacker space. There's no reason why all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore unless the whole thing catches on fire. Well then, actually that would be kind of cool too. Um, so, those were the five areas. Now let's talk about the, the mobile hacker space, how I actually went about it. There's not too many slides and I'm freezing through fairly quickly. Uh, I may actually take a few questions because I would rather take some of the questions in here if I can get the time and that way we can stay in the cool air rather than the 125 Baker skin off outside uh, uh, Nevada air. So here's some pictures of what it was like before. Um, I mean, it, it, that's paneling in there wood paneling from, and I don't think that it was changed out. It's a 1987 Dodge B250 van. And I don't think anything had been changed out at all. And if you look up in the, on the picture, well, you, it's really dark up there. If, um, if you look on the slides on your disc that you got for free, there are, in the corners in that top picture is the green shag carpet. They had, it was an accent. I'm not sure why they thought that was cool, especially since the floor is orange. But uh, so we got the paneling and we've got the, oh, on the roof, you'll see in the, uh, the one on the right, uh, you kind of see it, but the, the, the roof is falling off. That's that fabric that's stuck to foam 
and the glue never stays on for more than a year and a half. Uh, it's got uh, you know, those crappy foam mattresses up at the top. You pull it out, you sleep on it. I don't know who does, especially a grown man. Uh, so I started gutting it. I basically took out 20 years worth of filth. And uh, that's a refrigerator in there, and you can see the dead battery from before. Uh, just basically tearing it out. I spent about, um, just gutting the thing, I spent about uh, uh, 20 to 25 hours just unscrewing everything and yanking it out, pulling stuff down. Uh, I spent a little bit more time actually on the roof, and it's not done yet, because what, what they do is they, they put glue on the roof, and then they put foam on the roof, and then they put glue on the foam, and then they put this ceiling fabric on there, and it all just starts coming apart, except for the glue that's attached to the foam to the ceiling never lets go. So uh, you have this foam that just doesn't want to come off of the ceiling. And you'll find examples of it when we go outside. Very annoying. Uh, so other things that um, mobile hacker space, I said that uh, it needed to have different inter and interior configurations. Uh, I also put restrictions on far as uh, workspaces would be strictly laptop because of the powerful. Uh, no no uh, desktops whatsoever, and a perfect example is right now that the, uh, in, the, um, the inverter that's in there is a 1200 watt. You put in a desktop that's 750 watts of pull, I'm done. You, you can't add anything else. Uh, I also wanted to be able to do video presentations and demonstrations, so what we talk about from here on out is focused around those concepts. We have a picture of here of a pegboard, and it's, like I said, it's all modular. I can, there's four pins, pull it off, throw it out the door, and you've got something else. Uh, it's designed to be able to hold at least a couple laptops. You can actually cram three people on that thing. Uh, the laptops connect to, uh, there's a hard line, and there's also a wireless, so if you need to actually access the internet through hard line for either speed purposes or because you're worried about your wireless or what have you, can't, you don't have wireless, we've dealt with that. Uh, we actually have the hard line as well. Uh, the shelving units, there's a power strip in there. Uh, we've got a switch. Um, there's also, we also have access to hubs. We have a hub in there if you need it. I don't know why, but just if you need it. Um, and we've got different routers as well. Uh, there's plenty of wall space for whatever else we need to do. Uh, the, we actually have a lock pick, uh, a panel with like six uh, locks on there. The idea is that the community that we have right now, they're very familiar with uh, computers, very familiar, uh, um, especially even with Linux, which is a surprise. Uh, but they're, they have uh, zero knowledge on hacking. So a lot of the stuff that we have in there is focused around uh, introductory hacking information. And one of the things that people have an interest in is the lock picking. And so we, we add that. And I actually have the picture of the locks in the back. Actually, I only got two locks on there. But anyway, you get the idea. There's the overhead bunk. It's about 20 square feet. Uh, nobody goes over there. It's by the chairs, so it's all free access for the server. There's no competition with people or anything like that. Uh, it does need to be secured. Right now, it's still using the, the wood panel that was the bed before. I'd actually like to replace it with the, a wire, uh, a wire um, shelving unit. That way, it provides additional cooling effect and, and uh, easier to secure things to it. Plus, it's not as heavy, and I'm worried about that thing falling on my head every time I drive it. So let's talk about cost. I bought that van for $2,000. The reason why I got it for $2,000 instead of $4,000, which is really about what I should have paid, it was because he was trying to sell it in November. Nobody wants to go camping in November, and uh, he was trying to get it sold fairly quickly, and we had a huge blizzard, so he was trying to dump it quick. Uh, the, the vehicle actually runs really well. My wife... Uh, she actually was driving a, our uh, uh, H3 up here, and uh, this thing has a V8 engine in it, and it was just hauling. And she was having trouble actually keeping up with this van. It, it, you'd be surprised. Uh, the, the original purchase price was $2,000. The cost of the interior components, and I'm not talking about the paint jobs or anything like that, just the things that you need to have up and running, uh, and it doesn't necessarily include the equipment either, uh, the shelving units, the panels, things like that, the the nuts and the bolts, the flooring, uh, that broke out to about $1,000. I get about 14 miles per gallon for gas. Uh, as I mentioned, round trip, $500. Insurance for me is $28 a month. It'll actually drop a lot more uh, in, in about five years because it goes into that, uh, that uh, antique 
thing, and, and um, there's a whole different category for a lot of that. Now, like I told you, I paid the starving artist 350 bucks to do the paint job. Uh, for, for people to get actually started on something like this, uh, they want to do something similar in their own community, look around for $3,000 to, to get started. Um, and that's it, and like I said. Uh, other than the insurance costs, which is $8 or $28 a month, I mean, there's no extra overhead. I'm done. Uh, the lab itself, actually, when it's fully loaded, has four networks. There's currently two in there. Uh, you can put two wireless, two hardwire. The two wireless, uh, what I right now that I have the two networks in there are ones, um, they're both wireless and hardwire, you know, how routers work, you know. You can run off Cat5 off the same router. But uh, one is connected to the internet using um, the Linksys mobile router using the EVDO card. So you get broadband access connecting to the internet through, you gotta have cell phone access, you're good to go. The other one is the, uh, it's also a Linksys mobile router, but uh, doesn't have the EVDO card in there so we can keep it as a lab, a local lab. And inside that, I've got a couple servers running right now. In fact, when we go out there, if you really wanted to, you could uh, boot up your laptop, connect to the lab, and there is a, uh, uh, from uh, another project I have, and I talked about this last, last year, was deice.net. We do, um, I do live CD, pen test live CDs. And uh, so I've got that on there. So, like I said, since the community is fairly new at this, this gives them an opportunity to actually hack against a server and do it in a safe environment. Uh, and then additionally, there's also another uh, project that uh, does Netcat tutorial. It's all web-based, and you actually get to hack the server that it's on. But that's in the lab, up and running right now. Uh, you can run fully loaded with four servers. There's currently two. I've got VMware, as I mentioned, virtualization kicks. And then uh, there's always, always the problem with CPU. Because of that rule that if you put it in there, you gotta be willing to see it walk away. Uh, I got a couple of lower end uh, laptops in there, bought them for $200, uh, the company was getting rid of them. They work great, but they're $200 and the processing speed is not nearly as great as something that, you know, you could buy down at uh, uh, Best Buy or something like that, new. Uh, it's projects, so let's talk a little bit about projects. Most people think of, of um, the van is intended to be covert and there's all, everybody naturally thinks right away about wireless and wireless hacking, Bluetooth hacking, things like that. Uh, that's obviously a practical project to do, um, but we, there are different venues that you can attack, or you can do projects based around. There's hardware, there's software, there's the actual vehicle itself, uh, there's interior and special projects as well. So for the hardware and software, there's wireless. We could do war driving, obviously. There's honeypot, wireless honeypot. That's a good concept, and I'd like to speak on that next year if, uh, if they let me. Uh, then there's the hardwire. Actually, you can access it through the wireless as well right now, but there's the live CDs. Uh, the vehicle itself needs some electrical improvements. Uh, the battery, battery bank under the vehicle, the better inverter. Uh, like I said, I got the 1200 watt inverter. It really is nice, but there are better ones out there. You gotta always worry about inverters because not only do they, every time you shift from one um, voltage to another or one amp to another, you, you lose about 10%. There are some inverters that are better than others. Like I said, the, the, mobile, the motor home community has got all this figured out and they talk about it to ad nauseum. So if you wanna be bored to, to, to tears, you can do that. Uh, and, and, uh, and people will be happy to talk to you about that online as well. So put battery, in, uh, battery bank under the vehicle, inverters, uh, solar panels. A lot of people have been asking me about solar panels. Solar panels is really great. Uh, I'd love to do that and you can mount them on top of the, uh, the fiberglass shell itself. I will probably need to do some reinforcement. There are some problems with that. Uh, you gotta worry about uh, power trickle. The, the deep cell batteries that we use don't like uh, trickle. Uh, they, they would prefer a different type of charge uh, than, uh, than just a trickle. Uh, your car battery loves trickles. I mean, that's what the alternator is there for, not deep cells. So you gotta worry about th those kind of things. Um, wind generator, you can get those. Now, the, the big problem with that is the, the cost. It really comes down to cost. Uh, it'd be a cool project to do, and if somebody wants to pick it up, that would be great. If, if uh, I just get a hair one day to do it, I'll do it myself. So some interior. We talked about solar power. I'd like to be able to get that uh, 
the hacker space up and running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, solar power would be the best way to do that in my mind. Uh, wired wireless sound system, one of the projects that uh, I want to do. I, there's other people that were talking about projects too and I, I don't really want to get into them because that might make them feel committed and I, I'm just going to talk about the stuff that I want to do. Um, so wired wireless sound system, I'd like to be able to run uh, conduits that allow people to connect into a speaker system, not only for actual uh, sp like uh, music, but perhaps even real presentations as well. Uh, you know, the ability to actually use some of these videos from DEF CON or something like that, 10 minutes, thank you, uh, to be able to use some of these presentations to these kids, uh, these, they're not all kids, they're a lot of adults, I'm serious adults. Uh, um, anyway, be able to present them in an environment where there's no distraction to other people who want to use the hackerspace for whatever they want to do would be great. Uh, so I'd like to be able to do a wireless. The, the Bluetooth is, is a great idea. Um, there's the internet security system. I'd like to be able to do that where a van is hooked up and will alert me to any sort of intrusions or anybody walking around the van. That would be cool. Voice activation, I, that's just a totally geeky thing that I'd love to be able to do. You know, power on, boom, off it goes. Be cool. And that's just the kid in me. But, um, okay. So, like I said, I want to try to get this done quickly. We only got 10 minutes left, um, which is probably fine. Uh, we're going to go outdoors after this so I can give you the technical talk. And we're going to talk about batteries. We're going to talk about the, the structure of the vehicle and all that fun stuff. Uh, but hopefully, that you've had an opportunity to understand how a mobile hacker space fits into this whole thing. And maybe you just expand your box. I'm not, I'm not necessarily encouraging you to go out and buy a hunk of junk yourself so the wife can yell at you, but I am encouraging you to at least think outside the box and, and, uh, and possibly see other ways of doing a hacker space beyond what everybody is locked into as far as a fixed site, very expensive monthly costs. Um, again, uh, since I didn't quite finish what I was saying, it's out, if you go through the contest area and you go straight to the back wall, There'll be an information booth on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side of the information booth is a couple of double doors. You'll feel the heat as you get closer to them. You pop that door open, you'll feel the heat once you get outside, and you'll probably just turn right around and say that the technical talk's really not that important. But I'll be out there, I'll open up the van, you guys can walk around inside. I would limit uh, your actual um, physical presence inside the van to only a couple, three minutes, or else we're gonna have to be pulling your bodies out. Uh, also, when you do, if you do go in, this is a van, and you'll always be able to identify a person with a van because there'll be this big red mark across their forehand as they try to get out, they'll hit their head on that thing. So you'll see what I mean, and uh, hopefully we won't be able to point at you and say, hey, guess what, you didn't duck, did you? Okay, so I'll be out there after this. I've got contact information, project site if you want more information. Um, if you guys are interested in helping me get back home, please contribute. There's a link you can do that. Anyway, uh, so anybody have any questions? No questions? Okay, I'm going to be quick. All right, if uh, that's all, then uh, I thank you guys for showing up on a Sunday, and I'll meet you outside, or at least a few of you. Thank you.